The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to what we note, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As I said last night, we went or yesterday, we went to uh, Putin Bay for part of our vacation. And uh, one of the things I noticed about Putin Bay, it, it's an island, of course, and a lot of rich people like to move, move to islands for some reason. Uh, sometimes it's for seclusion, though you won't get much seclusion there, especially in the summer, as it is packed with tourists, etc. But uh, anyway, we went uh, to the airport there on the little golf cart that we rented to drive around the island, which is the preferred mode of transportation if you are going there, uh, for example, via the Jet Express, a, a very large boat that goes 42 miles an hour. It has a capability to go 80, I believe they said, but they keep it down to 42. That's fast enough to get uh, out five, I don't know, was it 20 or five miles? I believe the island was five miles out. It took 20 minutes to get there. And uh, one of the things that I noticed in driving by the airport and along the lakeside were all of these very wealthy, beautiful homes. And uh, what definitely sparked my attention was seeing beautiful aircraft parked in the backyards of what are probably millionaires' homes. And it uh, was a definite pleasure to see this, as uh, in uh, most of my other travels, I've gotten to see how America has become poorer, not more wealthy. So it was nice to see some wealth still existing in this country. And if you have a different attitude and are envious because a man has two beautiful hot rod airplanes in his backyard and a beautiful home, then uh, you're part of the problem and not the solution. We should, our, we, our chest should uh, so blow up with pride when we see wealth in this country that the buttons on our jacket should pop. We should uh, admire wealth. We should be appreciative that there is wealth because without a wealthy people, you don't have a wealthy country, period. That's an easy principle to understand. No wealthy people, no wealthy country. Envy toward the wealthy is part of the satanic conspiracy, and you can tell because you're starting with a sin, envy. Anyway, it was nice to see that. Also last night, I watched a fascinating movie. Uh, it was uh, put out in 1955 called A Man, it's called A Man Called Peter is the name of it. Uh, you can watch it on Amazon Prime for free if you have Amazon Prime. Of course, you have to pay a yearly fee for that. Uh, as far as Netflix goes uh, and your monthly fee uh, for Netflix, I don't know if it's on Netflix, but it is on Amazon Prime and you can watch it there. Uh, 1955 foo, uh, film and there were lots of principles in that film of Bible doctrine. Of course you had to cut through the muck of Hollywood. Uh, they probably put in their own additions and uh, some of it may have been uh, what the minister actually thought that would be Peter Marshall. And uh, he had uh, some doctrine of course but in some areas he may have been lacking. But I'm not here to uh, talk about how far he went doctrinally. He did give the gospel message correctly. He may have been more of an evangelist than what you would call a Bible teacher. Uh, but he did very well in that area. And uh, it was a fascinating movie, especially uh, when you get to the distinction, distinction between the time of history now and the 
time of history then, especially when the movie was made in 1955, uh, the man and the woman, by law, even though married in the movie, sat in or slept in separate beds. Uh, we had all types of principles uh, that came out, such as the uh, beauty of a woman and how they had a certain protocol in those days, especially in the earlier generation, of such as women shouldn't smoke, and women shouldn't get drunk like the men do. And the men, uh, the men, they can drink and smoke, but the women, no, that's not uh, proper for a lady. And that was the protocol, and all of that was set into place uh, for a reason. And a young lady who later becomes Peter Marshall's wife in the movie got up and explained the reason for these protocols that they were following in society. Now it has nothing to do with the spiritual life. It has to do with what society had set up in terms of putting the woman on a pedestal and having the man uh, look at the woman as something different. And she explains all of that and why they followed these protocols up until this century or actually up until the 1960s and then the protocol uh, was gone and now women act like men and she explains all of these things in detail uh, and I thought it was a good speech though not related to Christianity but uh, related to probably how uh, it might be better for people to live in a society in such a way living under protocol and, and again not necessarily having to do with Christianity and then the song Hollywood picked I don't know if the pastor necessarily picked the song Old Time Religion, it's possible, but uh, was played then and all the students had a apparent change of mind about their attitude toward the pastor after that young lady spoke who later became his wife. All of it was fascinating to me just from a cultural standpoint and seeing how our culture has degenerated to the point to where people don't want to follow any type of protocol and of course uh, protocol is important in our spiritual life and protocol too is important just in human life in general we don't have protocol in our country anymore it's every man and woman for him or herself and uh, no real rules to follow at all and uh, we've gone downhill in the area of the four divine institutions volition well nobody's uh, responsible for what they do society is responsible marriage ah uh, let's redefine it family let's redefine that nationalism no not nationalism internationalism and so you see we have a total different way of thinking in fact a satanic way of thinking today among many in our country especially among the young people today who are going to colleges that have been infiltrated by communists for many 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 years, or should I say socialist, it doesn't really matter. But uh, that began in the 1960s. Anyway, it was just a good look at the contrast in history and to hear how the people spoke, or at least how things were portrayed in Hollywood, things were a lot different. And uh, they would not recognize this country today whatsoever uh, based on all the changes that have happened. We're not here to talk necessarily about these cultural changes. I just thought the movie was uh, interesting. I'll give you a little background on this pastor. He actually, um, I looked up some of his sermons today. He actually taught about the United States being a covenant nation. Uh, he grew concerned during his ministry that the United States was uh, losing out in terms of its spiritual fervor. So he talked about Elijah and Baal. You might have remembered Elijah. If you listen to Colonel Thame from his excellent Elijah series, I would recommend listening to that for sure. But uh, he talked about uh, how we are a covenant nation and what that means to be a special nation to God and what we say to now, now in terms of vocabulary, is client nation to God. Uh, the covenant nation would, would actually belong to Israel but that's the only way he could explain it. He probably didn't have a different system of vocabulary to go on. So in contrast to many of the pastors we have today, especially in terms of those who become famous and become part of 
uh, national life, he's uh, far greater than those I've seen ballyhooed on TV today. And here is a little bit about Peter Marshall. If you watch the movie, you might want a background on him. And I'll even read a small excerpt of one of his sermons just so I can uh, let you know how eloquent he was in terms of his speaking ability. Now, as far as eloquence goes, uh, he reminds me of a man in the Bible named Apollos. And you say, who's Apollos? Well, in Acts uh, 18.24, it explains who Apollos is. It says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor. In fact, as it comes out later in 1 Corinthians, he spoke with a great eloquence. And all of that came from his background as being learned in what would that in that day be the Greek language. And he spoke with a great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And that is how I would explain Peter Marshall. He reminds me of Apollos in terms of the fact that he spoke eloquently, he spoke pretty much accurately concerning Jesus Christ. And in the movie, it, he emphasized to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, emphasized some other principles of doctrine. Right man, right woman came out of it. All sorts of principles that uh, we lear we've learned in a different way, or at least I have, you may not have. But uh, it was a, just a different style. And it just shows there are different personalities that are given the gift of pastor teacher. Now he had the personality that most people would probably associate with the gift of pastor teacher because the he had an accent which is attractive to a lot of American people, Scottish, and also he spoke with such great eloquence that you couldn't help but listen. And in fact it is described that he painted pictures with his sermons. Now that was before television so a lot of people would read and they would recognize that he had a great at least writing skill and speaking skill and turning that writing into very uh, profound and very effective speech so as far as public speaking goes a very excellent public speaker that doesn't have to be true of every pastor teacher he just happened to fit the bill in that area the true power of the pastor teacher comes from the fact that he's given that gift at the point of salvation and the true power comes from whether he decides to execute the protocol plan of God, be filled with the Spirit, learn Bible doctrine on his own, and then be filled with the Spirit and teach that doctrine to his congregation. And that's what the issue is today. Not personality. It's always been that way. Not personality at all. As it goes for personality, I would not be here. So we have uh, Peter Marshall, born May 27, 1902, died January 26, 1949. He was a Scots-American preacher, pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., and he was twice appointed as the chaplain of the United States Senate. And um, if you don't know what the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. is, that is the place of worship for all of our presidents that we've had. They usually visit that church during their tenure. I believe Abraham Lincoln probably visited on rare occasion. I know he visited at least once, but Abraham Lincoln wasn't too fond of church, though he was fond of the Bible. He is remembered popularly from the success of the movie A Man Called Peter, which uh, began as a biography written by his widow, Catherine Marshall, and then it was uh, her biography was turned into a 1955 film adaptation. And the funny thing is, uh, he thought that a lot of his sermons were not worthy of publication. I think more than that, he did not want to publish his sermons because he didn't want them sold. He made that clear, at least in the movie, that he was not selling what he was putting out and to publish something a publishing company wants money so but his wife went ahead and 
published a biography concerning him and also a 1955 film adaptation came out which is what I saw last night and it was nominated for an Academy Award so th that would not be that movie would not even get close to an Academy Award today just to show the difference in our society something that more like uh, I don't know some crazy killer movie uh, would be would get an Academy Award before that would. I'm thinking of one now that was pretty out far out there that got a lot of awards, but I can't remember the name. He was born, by the way, in Coatbridge, Scotland. He heard a strong calling to the ministry at a young age, and despite having only fifty dollars, he immigrated to New York in 1927 when he was 24, and he graduated from Columbia Theological Seminary in 1931. The movie goes into more details of what occurred during that time. He was called as a pastor of the First Presbyterian Church, a small rural church in Covington, Georgia. After a brief pastorate, he accepted a call to a larger church in Atlanta, Westminster Presbyterian Church in 1933. In Atlanta, that's where he met his wife, Catherine Wood, Then he studied, who, and she studied at Agnes Scott College. She was going to be a teacher. She ended up being a preacher's wife. Uh, poor thing. They married in 1936, and they had one son, Peter John Marshall. Uh, his actual birth date is January 21, 1940, and he recently passed away on September 8, 2010. Peter J. Marshall followed his father into the Presbyterian clergy, and he ran a national ministry. Peter Marshall Ministries uh, from Orleans, Massachusetts, and Peter J. Marshall, that is his son, wrote many books on Christian faith in the United States. In 1937, Marshall became pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. In 1946, he was appointed as the U.S. Senate chaplain, serving from January 4, 1947, until his death of a heart attack at the age of 46 in 1949. <clears throat> and so I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just read, if I can pull up here, just a portion of his message. I can't be as eloquent as he was, but uh, I'll just read it. Uh, reading it, you'll probably get an idea anyway. And so they came to Calvary. They called it Golgotha. And visitors to Jerusalem would be asked if they agreed that, seen in silhouette, it suggested a human skull. It was a place to be avoided. It was where two great highways converged upon the city of Jerusalem. And down in the valley below, a place of stench, a place of horror, an ugly place where refuse always burned. And the evil-smelling smoke curled up and was wafted over the bra of Golgotha. That was the place of public executions. And there the procession stopped. Only as the nails were driven in did the shouting stop. There was a hush, because most of them were stunned and horrified. Even the hardest of them was silenced. It is not pleasant to watch nails being driven through human flesh. Mary, his mother, stopped her ears and turned away her head. They could hear the echo across the Kidron Valley. The hammer blows. Simon of Cyrene from time to time wiped away his tears with the back of his hand. Peter stood on the fringe of the crowd until hot tears filled his eyes and his heart broke in pieces. John stood beside Mary and supported her. The other women were weeping. But as soon as the Nazarene had mounted his last pulpit, as soon as the cross had fallen with a thud into the pit they had dug for it, the shouting broke out again. There were some who had followed him once, who had been attacked by the charm of the wonder worker. There were many among them who had accepted loaves and fishes at his hands, and now they shouted taunts at him. They remembered what he had said, and now they hurled his sayings back in his teeth. They threw up at him like barbed arrows of hate and malice, promises he had made, predictions and eternal truths that had fallen from his lips. Now they taunted him. They stabbed and wounded him with things he himself had said. I, he saved others, himself he cannot save. And you will note they, that they admitted here and now all the miracles he had performed. Hey, he had brought back the dead to life again. He had given sight to the blind eyes. He had straightened withered limbs. He had caused the cripples to leap and to walk and to praise God in their joy. Ah, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Miracle man, come on down from the cross and we will believe. One more miracle, the greatest of them all. 
Aha! Thou who wouldst build the temple in three days, Mr. Carpenter, thou hast nails in thy hand, thou hast no hammer. Thou canst not build a temple up there. Come on down from the cross, and we will believe thee. Older than Father Abraham, thou art very old now, but young enough to escape if thou would work another miracle. Come on down, and we will believe thee. They shouted until they were hoarse. The noise was so great that only a few of them standing near the cross heard what he said when his lips moved in prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One of the thieves crucified with him, drugged and half drunk, cried out to Jesus, Can't you see how we suffer? If thou art the Son of God, save thyself and us. He twisted himself upon his cross, he writhed his shoulders, and he leaned on the cross piece. And then he begged and taunted Christ, if what they said were true, to save all three in great redemption pain. What he sought was salvation from the nails, not salvation from sin, salvation from pain and suffering, not salvation from punishment. Then a spasm of pain gripped him, and he slipped until his weight once again fell upon the nails that held his hands, and he began to curse and to swear until his companion turned his head and rebuked him. What has this man done that thou should curse him so? Seeing that we are in the same condemnation, dost not thou fear God? They have some excuse putting us to death, for we broke the laws. We sought to start a revolution, but this man hath done nothing. Then said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus, his face drawn with pain, but his voice still kind, answered, This very day, when the pain is over, we shall be together again. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And the man comforted, set his lips to endure till the end. The sun rose higher and higher. Time oozed out like the blood that dripped from the cross. Jesus opened his eyes and saw his mother standing there and John beside her. He called out the name of John who came closer and Jesus said, You will take care of her, John. And John, choked with tears, put his arms around the shoulders of Mary. Jesus said to his mother, He will be your son. His lips were parched and he broke with difficulty, spoke with difficulty. He moved his head against the hard wood of the cross as a sick man moves his head on a sick man moves his head on a hot pillow. A thunderstorm was blowing up from the mountains, and the clouds hid the sun. It was strangely dark. The people looked up at the sky and became frightened. Women took little children by the hand and hurried back to the city before the storm would break. It was an uncanny darkness. He had never been so dark before. Something terrible must be about to happen. Women stood praying for Jesus and for the thieves. The centurion was silent, although every now and then he looked up at Jesus with a strange look in his eye. The soldiers were silent too. Their gambling was over. They had won and lost. Suddenly, Jesus opened his eyes and gave a loud cry. The gladness in his voice startled all who heard it, for it sounded like a shout of victory. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And with that cry, he died. Now we were all there that day on the top of the hill. The friends of Jesus and his enemies, the church people, they were there, as well as the people who never went to church. The priests were there, and the scribes, the greedy Sadducees, the hypocrites, the proud Pharisees with their robes, their broad-bordered uh, phylacteries, on which golden bells were sewn with golden thread. They were there, drawing their robes more tightly around them and standing with arms folded approvingly. They were there. The people who were always talking about the church and always talking about the Lord, the pious people on whose lips there was always glib quotations from scriptures, they were there. The unbelievers were standing beside them. The harlots were there, and their customers were there. They were all there. Simon of Cyrene was there, and the soldiers too. Peter was there, and John, and Andrew, and James, and Thomas, and Philip, and Matthew, and Bartholomew. They were all there. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? When we consider who were there, and when we are honest with ourselves, we know that we were there, and that we helped to put Christ there because every attitude present on that hilltop that day is present in our midst now, 
Every emotion that tugged at human heart then tugs at human heart still. Every face that was there is here too. Every voice that shouted then is shouting still. Every human being was represented on Calvary. Every sin was in a nail or on the point of a spear or in thorns. Of course, he's going a bit far here in, in his uh, trying to be eloquent. All sins were imputed to Christ on the cross and judged. We know that, but he's being eloquent. And pardon for them all was in the blood that was shed. We understand the blood is simply a symbolism. Nineteen hundred years have passed away, but the range of the centuries with our calloused tears have not yet washed away the blood from the rotting wood of a deserted cross, nor have the winds covered his footprints in the sands of Judea. Calvary still stands, and you and I erect the cross again and again every time we reject Christ. The hammer blows are still echoing somewhere in the caverns in our heart and mind. Every time we deny him, every time we fail to do what he commanded, he is being crucified again. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I was. Were you? Then he goes into the prayer and into the uh, area where he asked them to uh, to, to basically believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, uh, being an evangelist, sometimes they don't put it straight to the point. And, but you can see that he was very eloquent in his speech. And uh, in some of his other messages, he gave the gospel far more clearly. But uh, that was the man who came to uh, Washington. And uh, today, I don't think he would be allowed especially when he began talking about uh, the faults of America and the fact that uh, we need an Elijah of today is what he was saying. So that comes from Peter Marshall. And uh, I wouldn't recommend going and buying all of his stuff up. You'll go backwards in the word. <laughs> it's just part of no noting a, an evangelist, uh, more of probably who would be an evangelist, a great evangelist of his day. Well, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Hebrews 12, 16. And just let me check something real quick. I believe I wanted to start with the fact that uh, when it starts out talking about sex, I'm starting at verse 16. We're talking about Esau, who afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, that is, uh, the blessing that uh, was part of his heritage, that's what it's talking about, referencing the Old Testament, refer referencing the fact in the Old Testament where Esau, for a mess of pottage, sold his inheritance. And he also sold out on the fact of eternal life for a mess of pottage. So he wanted to inherit the blessing. He was rejected even though he sought the blessing with tears. He could not change his mind concerning what he had done or concerning the fact that he would not believe in Christ as it comes out in Hebrews. He was an unbeliever. And even though he sought salvation with tears, he did not receive it. Why? He had turned in his inheritance, his eternal inheritance, for a mess of pottage. That's what unbelievers do. But I'm here to tell you believers turn in their unique spiritual life of freedom for a mess of pottage. And pastors, those of you who hear me, you pastors, many of you, have turned in Bible doctrine for a mess of pottage, for a mere stipend from a negative congregation. What happened to you? What's going on in your thinking? Is it more important to become a salesman? Is it more important to become nothing more than a human viewpoint propagator of uh, some type of public speaking in which you become a motivational speaker 
rather than being a great pastor of the Word of God. More important for you to lose out on that crown of righteousness, which is eternal in nature, for a mess of pottage, which only lasts for a little while. Where's your thinking? I would rather toil in dung than to compromise on the Word of God because people are negative. This is the time in which we need you most, pastors, to go back to your first love. Do you want, when it comes to the evaluation throne, to be condemned by your own previous words when you were teaching doctrine? When you go to the Bema evaluation, you know what it is, you've heard of it, the evaluation throne of Christ. You've heard of it because I've heard you teach it. Where are you now? What happened? The economy got bad and so you wanted to continue teaching and the only way was to get a bigger crowd? Why go work with your own hands? Are you beneath? Or are you above the Apostle Paul? For a little mess of pottage, you go and wallow in the grossness of the cosmic system? For a mess of pottage, you give away your ordained right to stand up and reprove and correct and to teach? To be one who will stand at the judgment and receive double the portion of either embarrassment or blessing for all eternity. I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't want to be. I can't even be a car salesman. Much less would I try to sell anything related to the Word of God. I wouldn't make any money on it anyway. But even if I could, I wouldn't. Well, I'm sure that's some of the motivation. Uh, other parts of the motivation may be approbation lust. You just got tired of having that thorn in your flesh all the time of people criticizing you. Well, has the criticism stopped? No. And even if it has, you have exchanged. That? That's not even a mess of pottage. That's worse. That's a mess of dung. You exchange the freedom of the spiritual life and your ordained responsibility to teach it correctly for what? And congregation. I know you get upset from time to time. I do too. That is when getting chewed out. I've been chewed out a lot. It was part of my preparation for the ministry. It's like, okay. You're going to have to chew out a lot of people, so let me, let me let you know how it feels first. I didn't know I was going to be in the ministry at the time, but I got chewed out quite often. It didn't feel good. Sometimes chewed out wrongly, actually most of the time. So what? Congregation, are you so stuck on yourselves and so involved in the cosmic system that you are offended? As long as the Word of God is being taught and your soul is being edified, you better stick right wherever you are learning the Word of God. Because it's rare in this country. It's more rare today than it ever has been in all of our history. And we are suffering from it. And in the months and years ahead, we are going to see calamitous events in this country like you never have seen before unless there is a turnaround, unless you get with the unique spiritual life. And you say, you talk about that a lot. Well, what is it? Well, it's tremendous. There's so much to it. It's going to take me my whole life to teach it. So just stick around. You'll learn what it is. Rebound and keep moving disregarding those things that are behind and pressing onward toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is it? It is using the faith rest drill. It is mixing the promises of God with faith. What is it? It is grace orientation. Becoming so oriented to grace that Christianity becomes attractive to those who watch you live. I've had it happen to me before. 
Someone said, I see you toil at this machine. They didn't actually put it that way. They say, I see you working so hard and you do it with a smile on your face. How do you do that? Well, then I proceeded to give the man a box of tapes I was listening to. And then he happened to listen for a while. I don't know what happened to him after that. He got fired from the job, I believe. But at least he got a chance during that short time that I knew him to listen to Colonel Thiem, and he did so observing behavior, observing contented behavior, not observing gossip, maligning, and judging, not observing the normal things that one observes in life, but observing something far greater, a contentment that comes from the unique spiritual life under sometimes bad circumstances. Though I thought having a job was just fine. Didn't bother me much. <clears throat> so that's my exhortation. Now let's get on moving. We have the principles of hope for a client nation. Which actually the word hope in the Greek, when it's used in its biblical context, means confidence. But just for the sake of time, we will use the word hope, not for the sake of time, but just because the word is bambied around so much. Principle number one, you cannot buy hope. Hope is not for sale. So by way of application, confidence in your eternal life, hope one. Confidence in your spiritual life, hope two. And confidence in your eternal eternal life and what is beyond in terms of receiving your eternal rewards confidence in receiving your eternal rewards confidence at not being ashamed at the coming of the resurrection being confident in that all of that is not for sale and any pastor who puts his stuff up for sale has lost his ministry of grace immediately Principle number two, you cannot legislate hope, for hope is the monopoly of God and demands relationship with God. Principle number three, government cannot give you hope, for hope is a confident relationship with God. Government tries. What government does is keep you from getting that two of those fine, nice, sporty airplanes out in your own backyard. That's what government does. Government keeps you from succeeding. Government traps you into some system in which you receive a small stipend from them and then are dependent upon them oftentimes for the rest of your life because it's so seducing. And you have exchanged your human freedom. That is, those of you who are able to work. Of course, there are those disabled, and of course, they need help, and there's nothing wrong with receiving uh, state help. That's all been decided to be part of the common good, and I happen to agree. Help the disabled, even help the needy, at least give them a hand up, not a hand out. You know, a short time of help to get on their feet and become productive in society. We all get knocked down. And there was a system of such in the Old Testament when Jesus Christ ruled. So if Jesus Christ had some type of system like that, then uh, following that system would not be wrong, of course. But to have such a system with the thought that you are going to eliminate poverty is ridiculous. To have such a system with the thought that you're going to uh, make a utopian society is wrong. Having a system that enslaves people to a government is wrong. And the way our system works is it buys votes. Of course, Jesus Christ didn't need any votes. But our system, that is Jesus Christ, when he ran the theocracy in Israel until the time of Samuel, he didn't need any votes. He was king. And he still is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that will be demonstrated at the Second Advent. 
And then there will truly be a time of no poverty, but not until then. In fact, our Lord told us the poor will be with us always. No form of socialism, no form of dependence upon government will act as any type of hope for a people. It will destroy a people and is destroying the greatest country that has ever existed during, these church, during this church age. Even though it might be a short time, it's been the greatest time ever. Hence, hope or confidence is for Gentile client nations to God of the church age. And that hope always depends on believers executing the unique spiritual life. And that execution of the unique spiritual life means that you will therefore become a blessing by association to the nation and to people in your periphery. You won't be a thorn in their flesh. You will be a blessing. So what is it about teaching this that's so terribly hard? Well, people reject Bible doctrine. I understand it, but they haven't rejected you. I am of the opinion that this is, as far as the pastor is concerned in his function and keeping the amount of problems out of his life as necessary is to have a small congregation, very small. The smaller the better. That is, unless it gets down to zero. Then he's talking to himself and that might be a problem for his mental health or Maybe it might show a problem with his mental health, but as long as someone's listening, someone's listening, and two or more are gathered together, you and the pastor. Or, uh, I don't have the, the problem of having just one or none. I have others who listen via other means, internet and all of that, non-face-to-face, -face, which is totally legitimate. Don't let some pastor who likes to see faces tell you otherwise. They have a weird idea about what is success and it's not God's idea. God's idea of success isn't about the number of people you can bring in. Now the Marshall guy, Peter Marshall, he was able to bring in a lot because he had a gift of evangelism. He was called a minister but he had a gift of evangelism and that brings in a lot of people just by its very nature. The gift of pastor teachers different God brings in and assigns him some sheep for a time. Different sheep on different occasions for a time. Some sheep are smart enough to hang around. Some sheep are dumb enough not to leave. And they hang around and bah at the pastor all the time. Or become a thorn in his flesh. Well, did, was that your problem? Is that why you would go astray from the Word? Is that why you would trade in your spiritual inheritance and what you could pass on to others for a mess of pottage? To remove a thorn in the flesh so you could be liked? That's the most pathetic reason. That's even worse than car salesmen. That's politicians. You weren't called into the ministry to be a politician with no integrity. You were called into the ministry to teach the word of God as soundly and correctly as you possibly can without flaw and without blemish. Not to water it down. Not to compromise because people aren't liking their little toes getting stepped on. And definitely not because it's becoming a discomfort for you because you don't like exhortation. You do not like reproving and correcting. I'm sorry, that's the responsibility that's been laid upon you. Take it seriously. Your nation depends upon you. I guess you would rather go to the evaluation throne and have to explain that reasoning to Jesus Christ. He won't buy it. You might justify yourself and say, well, he'll understand that I need the money to eat. He'll understand that 
the problems I'm facing are so difficult. No, he won't. Oh, he'll understand that you failed, and you'll understand that you failed at the Bama if you don't straighten out now. Get on the... What happened to your first love? It, it blows my mind. But I'm not in your situation. But I'll tell you what I'd do if I were in your situation. If we're that much of a trouble, before I would ever get involved to where I would be constantly teaching false doctrine and constantly receiving double punishment for it, I would quit the ministry and go be a car salesman if you're so good at selling something. You'll make a lot more money. I really don't understand. You're destroying your country. Those sheep need a leader, or they'll just bah right away. That's the confidence we need. We need pastors who have confidence in the Word of God themselves. Confidence that the Lord will provide during times of hardship. Confidence that the Lord will take care of those who do you wrong. best way to deal with any type of problem in a congregation is to not react. Oh, chew them out, but don't react. You can, choose, uh, you can chew them out as per the correction responsibility, the reproof and correction. But you, but, uh, you can't react in your own soul in terms of thinking about it constantly once you leave the pulpit and then you're thinking about what so-and-so said about you or what so-and-so is trying to do in some conspiracy or how they're trying to bring you down in some way. Look, the best way to knock out a conspiracy, even if just one's involved or a hundred, is to respond to the Lord and not react. Because when you respond to the Lord, you automatically frustrate their plans. They don't know what to do. They're just frustrated individuals and probably always will be unless they rebound and keep moving. You just keep moving. What's so hard about that? Have you forgotten these doctrines? I don't think so. Maybe so after this long, who knows. Mankind does not possess the power to perpetuate or guarantee peace on earth. These are concluding principles to the client nation. Not necessarily concluding the principles of freedom. I may extend it a couple of more messages. Mankind does not possess the power to perpetuate or guarantee peace on the earth. As our Lord said, there will always be wars and rumors of wars until the second advent. Matthew 24, 6 through 7. You should be aware of politicians who reject and diminish the military. Ezekiel 13, 10 through 16, who talks about the utter destruction that comes to a client nation that reduces its military. Beware of a liberal clergy who manufactures lies about world peace. That's found in Jeremiah 6, 13 through 14. We have today, mostly on the news, what I watched today was a, a bunch of... A, a, a bunch of nonsense about what what's going on in Syria. How we are go, how we are con contemplating getting involved in something that's really not our business. A civil war. Why? Because they used chemical weapons. Oh, they killed a hundred thousand people before with conventional weapons, but they used a chemical weapon. And it doesn't matter that the end result was the same. They died because they used a certain weapon which is against, quote, international law. That's a violation of the principle of nationalism. There is no international law. There's only the laws of the land that we should follow. The laws of the United States of America, which were founded on the Constitution. We, in our human freedom, have gone a long way from that. Now we're trying to police the world in our client nation arrogance by acting all haughty when they use a chemical weapon, when we have weaponry that can kill 
millions of people at once and should. What a bunch of nonsense. That's the foolishness of the thinking of the people and the fact that we have no pivot. And coming out of this could be calamitous results. Could start a world war. And it's stupid to go around and say, well, we're not really having a war. We're just killing some people. What, what are you doing? You're having a war. Don't parse words with me. Don't try to deceive me. Foolish politicians. Is that what you want to be? Pastors? The Supreme Court of Heaven can punish Israel without any help. That's principle number two. The Supreme Court of Heaven can punish Israel or the Jews without any help. Anti-Semitism is a guarantee for destroying a national entity and we are skating on thin ice in our relationship with Israel and everything else in our policy attitude toward Israel. It's dumb, it's stupid, and it's evil. Principle three, all failure of client nations to God includes both the spiritual and establishment principles. That comes out in Hosea chapter four, one through six, which we've studied. The failure of believers to execute God's plan and purpose results in a shrinking pivot of mature believers and the rejection of the establishment principles which has occurred. Principle four, we have the fantasy notion. And this is the fact that politicians are seeking power with utopian plans and this will destroy a national entity. And this has been around for a long time, and don't you dare think communism is dead. It's alive, and it's always going to be alive in Satan's system. For the utopian concept came into history in 1516 by Satan himself. And he did so through a book written by Sir Thomas More, and it was called Utopia. It was the idea of a state of political and social perfection. Utopianism involves the dreams and schemes of an imaginary, divorced from reality, status of political and social perfection. It's impossible. Utopianism is the satanic concept of the millennium brought on by the work of mankind rather than the work of God. And this is a warning of Ezekiel chapter 13, 10 through 16. This is Satan trying to reproduce the millennium, by doing everything the opposite of what our Lord prescribes. And what is everything the opposite? All you have to do is go on the four big principles of divine institution and see the opposite. Number one, volition. You're responsible for your own actions. Satan's, Satan's satanic system says, no, you are not. Everyone else is responsible. The entirety of society is responsible for the decisions you make because environment is responsible for the decisions you make. So you make your decisions based on environment. If you're a criminal, ah, oh, you poor thing, you must be a criminal because you were brought up in a bad environment. There are plenty of criminals who live in a putin bay type setting. This satanic concept's wrong, but it's antithetical to our Lord. Everything our Lord does, Satan does the opposite. And then he tries from doing the opposite in his arrogance to build a millennium by doing the opposite and it only destroys itself as will be illustrated in the tribulation. So the second of the institutions, marriage. Satan says, under the cosmic system, Ah, marriage is a hassle. Just live together. In fact, let's totally redefine marriage. Marriage isn't even between a man and a woman necessarily. It can be between, between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Why not? Are you not a society of equality and equitability? How dare a civilized society not show the same rights just because someone has a different sexual preference. After all, they didn't choose to be that way. Volition. So then you have 
Number one and two right there, volition and marriage. Family? Well, let's redefine family. Oh, a homosexual couple, they should be able to adopt? Sure, why not? Daddy and daddy and mommy and mommy? That's normal. That's what Satan says. God says wrong. Redefine family. And nationalism? No, not, in, not nationalism. We need internationalism. In fact, we need international laws. And in fact, well, we need to go to the UN every time there's a problem. The United Nations International. The United Nations is nothing more than the Tower of Babel. And that's why God destroyed the Tower of Babel, because it was a symbol of internationalism. And that's why he may very well destroy the United Nations right here in the United States. And the United States will go right along with it. Because we've supported such nonsense in our lack of understanding. And because people, believers, have not executed the protocol plan of God, they have not, they've exchanged their spiritual freedom for a mess of pottage. They've exchanged all the happiness in the world for a frantic search for happiness. Many believers have done just as the unbelievers in my generation. They've laughed off marriage. They've laughed off the fact that homosexuality is wrong. They make jokes about it as if there was anything funny there's nothing funny. You're twisted in your thinking. You're so far into cosmic too. It will take a bolt of lightning to get you out of there. And God will send it if he knows you will respond. And if he knows this nation will respond, he'll send the punishment necessary to make it respond. And it will be a shock. That's how the divine punishment comes in shock waves. We're due for a shock wave. It's going to be the biggest one we've had since the Civil War. If that doesn't do it, you can kiss your country goodbye. And if you're in reversionism, you can kiss your own butt goodbye because you will be wiped from the face of the earth. So hope in a client nation is related to the pivot of mature believers who execute the spiritual life of the church age and become a vehicle of blessing by association. You're only going to get there if you as a congregation, not necessarily you in particular. When I say you, I'm just speaking about who, whomever's in earshot and listening to me. You may be just fine. I don't know. You may not. Some of you listening to me may be listening to me with a, a clenched mouth, but you keep coming back for some reason. You don't know why, but you're back and you're listening. And you're disagreeing and trying to find points where to disagree and probably looking up scriptures that talk about love and everything else, and you're saying, I don't sound lovely. Well, you don't even know what those scriptures mean. And I know I don't sound lovely, because I'm chewing you out. But, you might be listening now, and you might stop listening for a while. When the disaster comes, you might come running right back, because you'll say, Hey, that guy, I remember that guy, he said this would happen. Well, you better run back, because if you don't, it's over. This country's finished. Done. It's going to be tragic. Shocking. I won't even put it in the description because you wouldn't believe me. But I've studied what occurs in the last stages of a nation's life and it is horrid. Just as dying the sin face to face with death is horrid. A collective national death is 300 million times more horrid. 
Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. If there's anyone listening who is without Christ, without true hope, without eternal life, may they come to understand that Jesus Christ has an eternity past provided eternal life for them. And he did so by carrying out the plan and going to the cross after living 33 years of perfection upon the earth. While on the cross when darkness came, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, as all the sins of all the world were poured out on him and judged. For John 3.16 states, For God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. You say that sounds simple. It's simple only because Jesus Christ did the hard part for you. Plus Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you have the privacy right now to make a decision as to whether to believe in Christ or to reject him. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.